Oh, wow. Well, uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. We just had a, a nice comment from a participant thank us already for having this um, session because a family member has just had uh, GIST surgery. So um, with that, we will go ahead and get started um, today. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, on our third Padres Pedal to Cause Road to Discovery series. Um, I'm Ann Marburger. I'm the Executive Director of Padres Pedal. Um, and I know many of you on the on the line have heard from us and participated for years and years. And I also know that some of you are new. So I mean, if you're new and joining for the first time, our mission is to accelerate cures for cancer by funding collaborative research and clinical trials among San Diego's top research and care institutions. Um, and today is an opportunity to hear from one of the tremendous teams that we've funded over the past few years. Um, over the past several weeks and months, we've had the honor and privilege to share updates from a few of these different research teams that we funded. Um, the first one focused on Rady Children's Hospital and a team that we just funded um, that's studying personalized approaches to pediatric medulloblastoma. Um, and in that first webinar, we heard I mean, uh, the story of a young girl that was diagnosed at age two and a half and what their family has been through over the past year and a half in their cancer journey. Um, and, and then a few weeks ago, um, in our second webinar, we focused on a collaborative team studying lung cancer. Um, and we featured a 56-year-old woman um, who was stage four lung cancer, and she shared her amazing journey overcoming um, and continuing to fight lung cancer. And then, of course, today we have a phenomenal panel um, of researchers and care providers from UC San Diego Health um, who are experts on a very rare form of gastrointestinal cancer. Um, which is called gastrointestinal stromal tumor, or GIST. Uh, and so if you missed our previous webinars, um, you can view those on our Padres Pedal to Cause YouTube page, where we will also post um, this recording after today. Uh, in just a few minutes, I will introduce um, the rest of the team here. Uh, the clinical team is being led by Dr. Jason Siklik, along with Dr. Adam Bergone and Dr. Christian Metallo. Um, the team received funding from Padres Pedal to Cause in 2018 um, for an open-label phase two clinical trial testing the e efficacy of a drug called temozolamide um, on, a, on a subset of GIST patients. So um, we're going to get the chance to hear directly from that team in just a minute. Um, before we go there, I do want to just hit on the purpose and the goals of today's session. So um, none of this research would be possible without the fundraising and participation from, from you all and our Padres Pedal donors and, and volunteers and, and fundraisers. So this is really a chance for you all to get to hear directly from the research teams that you all are funding and to ask questions and learn about their research. Um, and secondly, um, a goal is to really reiterate this theme that is woven throughout everything that Padres Pedal the Cause does, and the, and the theme is collaboration. So from a community and team building perspective, all the way to the research that we fund, collaboration is woven throughout everything we do. And although all the panelists um, today are from um, UC San Diego Health Morris Cancer Center, you'll learn that their backgrounds and skill sets and training are very diverse, and, and it's their collaboration that is making this project distinct. Um, so next, I just want to take a second to hit on a couple housekeeping items today. Um, all of our participants are muted, so um, if you have any background noise at your home or in your office, that's okay. We can't hear you. Um, we plan to have about a 45-minute dialogue today, um, and we will save time for Q&A at the end. Um, because you're muted, uh, we encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A box um, right here in the Zoom screen. I'll show you a screenshot in just a second. But feel free to submit your questions as soon as you have them so I can kind of weave that into the dialogue with um, the panel, panel members today. Um, we are recording this session so we can share it again afterwards. And then we will also do our best to help with any technology issues. Um, there's a chat feature um, where you can see here on the bottom if you enter any feedback or issues that you're having in the chat room, we'll do our best to help you. Um, and then here is the Q&A uh, where you can submit your questions. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and dive into the content. And I mentioned earlier that um, today we're going to be talking about GIST. Um, and to set the stage for that, GIST is a very rare cancer. Um, it makes up less than 1% of gastrointestinal tumors. Um, each year, about um, four to 6,000 patients in the, in the United States are diagnosed um, with this disease. And over just the last week, we've had the good fortune of meeting an amazing young woman who's pictured here, Sheila. 
um, and we got to meet her and her fiance, husband, Brady, um, who's also with us today, and we're going to hear from him in just a minute. But um, Sheila is actually a patient of Dr. Sicklick and the team at Moore's Cancer Center, and um, she couldn't be with us today because she's pursuing her PhD and she had class, but we thought her story was just so inspirational um, and important to hear that we, um, we filmed a video of her. And so we've, we've cut that down to about four or five minutes, and we're going to share that with you all so you can meet Sheila right now. I'm Sheila, um, and I've been fighting cancer since I was 14 years old. I'm 30 now, so it's been a 16-year journey. I, was, I went in for a primary care appointment, so just like very standard um, routine checkup. My doctor noticed that I was really anemic, or sorry, he noticed that I was really pale um, and was like, you should get some blood work done. And so then he got blood work and then they misdiagnosed me for a year. They kept thinking that it was iron deficiency anemia. And then finally they did an endoscopy because they thought that um, the, the virus that they thought was there, which is H. pylori, um, should have been gone by then, um, but it wasn't. And then that's when they admitted me. I had three surgeries, one when I was 14, 16, and 19. During that time, I also did three rounds of oral chemo which we now know like aren't um, effective on the specific kind of just that I have. And so after like I was 19 or 20, I actually enjoyed like almost a decade of stable disease. And at the end of 2018, I got scans and it started showing that like my disease was like increasing both in quantity as well as um, the size of the tumors. And my oncologist um, there referred me to the surgeons at UCSF and they pretty much shared with me that like they, there wasn't a treatment plan, so there wasn't like chemo. And there also, that surgery wasn't an option um, and pretty much like told me that my, like I, I just have to wait for organ failure. We found Dr. Cyclic and we're in the Bay Area and we just like booked an appointment and flew in to meet him. He spent two hours with us and he confirmed that surgery was something that we could consider and that we would probably have to consider to like reset the clock. Dr. Cyclic was like, look, you're young, we like you're healthy, and like, I'm gonna fight for you and we're gonna do whatever we need to so that like you have a long life. And I think that like, it was this really healing moment for me of realizing like, no, you want a doctor on your team who like believes you're gonna survive, you know, who like wants to help you live. Like that's really important. So that's when he started me on the clinical trial for Um, And I was patient zero, essentially. The, the trial worked. Right, so like my, the way that Dr. Cyclic describes it is like the cancer was going like this, then it was going like this, and with the temozolomide, it started flattening out. It stabilized everything, but like it had gotten to a point where like surgery was necessary. October 1st, actually 2019, um, Dr. Cyclic and his team and another surgeon went in and he took out 42 tumors. So it got to the point where like, even if the temozolomide worked, it was still like impacting my quality of life. So the truth is that like, just the cancer I have and other rare diseases need funding, right? Because we can go in and like, he'll operate, right? And like, fight for me for in, in that way. But like, if we don't find a long-term solution to curing this cancer, then like, I'm going to have like 10 surgeries in my life. And so it's really important work. Padres Pedal, Pedal um, funded that study. And so like, I've been able to have treatment because of the money that he received from you guys. So it's super important. And it's also like, you know, everybody needs an angel. Everybody needs like their person who believes in their disease, who's gonna like do the work around it. And he's that for me. And I think he's that for a lot of people with just. Thank you, Dr. Cyclic, Jason, 
am for saving my life. I know that I'm going to be okay and have a long life because of you. And um, I just can't thank you enough for fighting for me. So yeah, fighting for me and Brady and for being on our team and for loving us. We love you. <laughs> so thank you. Wow. Well, um, it's so much is packed into that five minute video and it's, um, I, you know, it's emotional and it's, um, hugely inspirational and it's, um, it's hard to tell the whole story of Sheila in, in just five minutes. And, um, I mean, she's been fighting cancer for over half her life. And, um, it's just amazing that she's had the good fortune of, of meeting um, Dr. Siklik and the rest of the team at UC San Diego. So um, we also have Brady um, with us today. And it was quickly apparent to us when we met um, Sheila and Brady that they were a team. I um, in addition to the team that they have at Morris Cancer Center, they are a team like no other. Um, and he's been and continues to be an incredible cheerleader and, and just sidekick uh, to Sheila. And so um, one of the things that he uh, mentioned, he said, we want to have a long life together. And that requires Dr. Sicklett to do his work. It requires Padres Pedal the Cause to do your work um, and for them to do their work. And so he's with us today. Um, and Brady, thanks for, for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, can you just describe for us a little bit what it's like, how long you've, you've known Sheila and what it's been like to be on this journey with her? Yeah. Um... You know, Sheila and I have been together for about um, four years now. Uh, she was a, a sublet in, in the house I was living in, and within a month, she was more than a sublet in the house. Um, and um, uh, the, this journey's been quite wild. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's simultaneously like such an incredible honor and such a... Um, an incredible reflection of what's really important in life. And, and it's been such an amazing, I mean, it really has brought Sheila and I together in a, in a way that we never, I, I think it would have taken decades for us to. Um, and it also is just incredibly hard and scary. Um, you know, there, um, I, I can't emphasize enough the part in Sheila's story where when we were with other doctors, they essentially told us it was terminal and there was nothing to be done. Um, and we walked out of that hospital um, with a lot of despair and a lot of um, fear and dread. And um, we sat in that for a while until we were able to find Jason, who <laughs> said, no, we, we, we got this. You know, we, we can do something about this. And, and so, um, yeah, it's been both really an amazing journey and also a really uh, hard and scary one. I, I can hardly imagine. And I, um, you know, hearing when you were at um, San Francisco saying that there was no option and that you had to wait for organ failure and then getting to meet Jason and the team and saying, we can do surgery right now. We can solve this. I can't imagine how much hope and inspiration that provides. One of the things that Sheila shared also was that, you know, she had this decade of hell um, and then it came back and she mentioned this part about it sort of being a chronic disease for her. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that we want to explore with the panelists going forward. Um, but one thing that I also just wanted to hear your impression, Brady, of working with Jason and the team of what, what that has been like um, for you um, and what it means kind of going forward for you too. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that like, you know, none of us ever really know like what's going to happen tomorrow or, you know, how secure we are in our own health or our, you know, family or loved one's health. Um, but with Sheila and I, like, we really know like what we're up against. Um, and it's a long-term process and it's a scary disease. Um, and so we real we need a team. Um, and we need, we need ongoing advancements. You know, currently the, the clinical trial that Sheila was fortunate enough to be on and we were fortunate enough to get from the doctors that are on this call and scientists and oncologists on this call um, was effective in stabilizing the disease, but kind of, you know, stop there. And we don't know how effective it will be every time. Um, you, you all saw Sheila, she's amazing. And I'm totally in love with her. Um, and, and I, and I need that I need her to be around for a really long time. Um, and so that means that 
we need to constantly be figuring out what's the next thing, what's the next treatment. Um, you know, Sheila mentioned it without it, I'll have to have 10 surgeries. But the truth is, is that like, that's really uh, a hard thing on a human body. And <laughs> we can't really have that happen. So we need, we need options. Um, and we've got one right now and, it, and it's helpful. Um, but we need that one to be explored more and we need more options and for, for this to work, <laughs> for our life to be what we want it to be. And so, yeah, you know, Sheila said, we've got an angel and, you know, Jason has been that for us. And I'm just meeting Adam and Christian cause they're behind the scenes, but I know they're part of that angel posse that is, uh, that, that's keeping us going and, and taking care of us um, in ways that we can't even imagine. Well, thank you, Brady, um, for being with us. And I, I'm sure it's very hard to, to share the emotions and the experience that you've been through. And so I, I'm really appreciative that you're, you have the courage to do that. And I think what a great entree way to, to meet the Angel Posse team that's behind the scenes, um, helping Sheila and you. So um, with that, we do have um, the three-part team that Padres Pedal to Cause um, funded back in 2018. Um, and we have um, Dr. Jason Siklik, who is a professor of uh, surgery at UC San Diego Morris Cancer Center, um, Dr. Adam Bergone, who's a medical oncologist uh, at Morris Cancer Center, and then Dr. Christian Matalo, who is an associate professor of bioengineering. So very diverse um, backgrounds and a great story of how you all came together. Um, and so um, I want to just start by um, giving you all a chance to share a little bit about your um, education and training uh, and your, your current focus and um, really also what, what got you into cancer and GIST. And so, um, Jason, we're going to go with, with first names uh, moving forward. So can you tell us a little bit about your background? Perfect. Well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, share our story today. And, um, you know, the story of Brady and Sheila is, is why we do this. You know, it's... Uh, you know, that, this is what keeps us going. You know, when times are rough, you know, stories like this are, are, are fuel for us. Um, my training goes back to, I, I went to UCLA for medical school. I did my general surgery residency at Johns Hopkins University, um, completed that in 2008, and then did a surgical oncology fellowship in 2008 through 2010 at Memorial Sloan Kettering. In the midst of my time during residency, I also spent three years doing research um, at uh, Duke University. So I've kind of traveled up and down the East Coast. And in 2010, it was time to come back to the West Coast where my family and I was from. So, so we landed here in, in uh, 2010 and um, have been uh, here ever since. My, um, my clinical practice has, uh, has really evolved over time with really now about 40% of my practice is is seeing patients with GIST, which is a type of rare tumor that you heard about. It's a sarcoma, which is a tumors that arise from bone, muscle, fat, uh, nerves. And another 40% of my practice is seeing other types of sarcomas. And then the remaining 20% of my clinical practice is, is uh, liver tumors. And really, my, 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 my laboratory um, focuses on studying gastrointestinal stromal tumor GIST. And so really, it's a marriage of my clinical practice with my laboratory that helps kind of keep fueling this forward where, you know, we're doing this from bench to bedside and bed, bedside to bench and back and forth. And it's a, it's a constant iterative process. I'll hand it Great, over. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Adam. Sure. Uh, again, thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to participate in this, uh, this webinar. I think it's a great experience for us all. Um, I am a medical oncologist, as you mentioned. So my training pathway, um, you know, went down sort of that route early on. I did my medical school training at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. I did an MD and a PhD there in molecular biology. I came out here to San Diego actually for uh, the remainder of my clinical training. So I did a residency in internal medicine and then my fellowship in uh, medical oncology and hematology here at UC San Diego. Um, and it was actually during that time that I had the opportunity to connect with Jason when I was still um, early on in my fellowship. And uh, he's really responsible for, you know, budding my own interest in, in just research from the research perspective. And then as I finished my training and joined the faculty here in 2017, um, I had the opportunity to start making that part of my clinical focus as I joined the 
gastrointestinal malignancy disease team. Um, so just as a, a major part of my clinical practice, and I've been lucky to be involved in some of the continued research opportunities um, like this clinical trial. So I'm the principal investigator for the trial that uh, we were funded by, by the PEDAL program. Um, so I'm responsible for the clinical trial oversight. And then between myself and one of my medical oncology partners, Dr. Fanta, um, we're the treating physicians for all the patients that are enrolled in the study. Excellent. Thank you. And, and Christian, um, you have a very different background. Um, can you share that with us? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Anne. Uh, and I, I also want to say this is a, a really wonderful opportunity for me as a scientist to get exposed to the clinical side, to actually see the patients. We normally get shut out of, not shut out of this side. We don't get to expose to the great reminder of how impactful our work can be. Uh, my, I, I'm a PhD uh, scientist. I, I received my PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, in chemical engineering uh, back in 2008. And then I did an American Cancer Society funded postdoctoral fellowship at MIT, where I started to study the metabolism of tumor cells. And I've taken that through to, to this point. I started my lab at UCSD in the bioengineering department in 2011. And, and since that time, we've really just been trying to understand what tumor cells eat in the same way that all of our different tissues, our brain and heart need to need energy to survive and grow, so do tumor cells. And what my lab does is try to study the inner biochemistry of tumor cells and try to find ways to exploit that to kill them or stop them from growing. Awesome. Well, I'm very interested to hear about how this collaboration came to be. But before we get there, I was hoping, um, Jason, could you just give us an overview, uh, just as a rare cancer that perhaps some of us have not heard about before? Um, can you talk a little bit about how prevalent it is, how it usually manifests itself, and then also um, tying in a little bit of Sheila's story, that is it common for someone to be treated for this for 16 years? Um, that'd be great. You're muted right now. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So uh, GIST or gastrointestinal stromal tumor is a tumor that, uh, as I mentioned, is a sarcoma, meaning that it arises from not the lining of our, of our GI tract, as we might expect of sort of common colon cancer or stomach cancer, but it arises from the nerve cells that um, are in the wall of our intestine. And these are the cells that actually are thought to be the the pacemaker cells of our gut, meaning that just like we have cells in our heart that tells our heart to beat and we don't have to think about, you know, every moment when our heart takes a, you know, beat, just the same way when we eat food, there's cells in our intestines that tell our intestines when to peristalsis or when to move and so that food gets moved down. In this way, again, we don't have to think about it. These are the cells that give rise to gist. So as you can imagine, these cells are everywhere from the esophagus all the way down to the to the end of the GI tract. And so GIST can occur anywhere from the top to the bottom of our GI tract. Now, the GIST was, is really unique in that it set the precedent for the concept of precision medicine that we think about today. And it was back in the late 90s that there was a discovery of a gene that, that was uh, mutated in GIST. And it just so happened that um, uh, a group up at um, Oregon Health Sciences University, led by Brian Drucker, who's a former UCSD graduate. Um, and he um, was working on studying a drug that it turned out studied uh, that targeted the same gene and sort of one thing led to another. And at the time, uh, one of the groups in Boston had just made a cell line for the first time to grow these cells in culture. They tried the drug on, on these tumor cells and lo and behold, it worked. And so that rapidly went from the, co the laboratory to phase one, phase two, phase three, and all the way to FDA approval within about three years. So it was a really rapid transition from, from discoveries in the lab to the clinic. And at that point, you know, everybody threw up their hands and was cheering and we had cured gist. And what happened in the early 2000s is we started realizing that there were subsets of GIST that the drug didn't work on. And, and as Sheila mentioned, she was, you know, had one of these subtypes where it didn't work. And what kind of came out with time is that we, 
realize that GIST, which normally presents in people, you know, anywhere from sort of their 40s to 70s, 80s, kind of the, the average time is around in the mid 60s, is that, you know, patients would present with anemia like she did or with some um, abdominal pain or just vague symptoms and these would get discovered. Um, but what started becoming more apparent is that there were younger people that were also presenting with these tumors in their teens, in their 20s, their 30s, so much younger than we would expect them um, to present. And so what that ultimately led to was the discovery that some of these tumors were not caused by this kind of classic mutation in this gene, this kit gene that, that I was alluding to before, but in genes that are regulating metabolism, or as, uh, as Christian was mentioning, the, the ability, the, the, the mechanisms in our cells that regulate the ability to, for the cells to use sugar and to basically survive. And it turned out that these, these tumors, you know, were only a small subset of the four to 6,000 GIST patients that you mentioned every year, somewhere on the order of probably 200, maybe 300 at the most per year in the US. But making this sort of, you know, uh, you know, even a worse scenario, besides the fact that the drugs that we had thought about using didn't work, this is occurring in young people. So adolescents, young adults, is that most of these are hereditary, meaning they're passed from parent to child. So you've added now a third layer of complexity to this, is that it's not just one person and it's bad luck, it's a hereditary syndrome. Now, mm -hmm. Sheila's a unique in that, that there's an, another subset of these that's caused by the exact same genes, but they're not hereditary and nobody knows exactly why. Um, some patients get these as well, but again, but the underlying mechanism is, is a defect in metabolism of cells and the sugar metabolism in specific. And so that's kind of what led us to then start investigating this, um, this subtype of GIST and not just GIST in general, where we really start trying to subset out and really focusing on one group of patients and trying to tackle that rare subset rather than saying, we're gonna treat everybody all the same and that we can really think about personalizing this treatment for each for each individual great um thank you so i, I understand that it affects a very wide range of ages and, and people um adam i was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the typical treatment um options for just patients yeah so you know as jason mentioned just as really a prototype for a tumor that our our knowledge of the sort of molecular changes that occur within the tumor uh, has really helped us come up with treatments that are very effective for the majority of just patients. So Gleevec or Imatinib, as um, Jason was talking about that drug discovery, as well as other tyros, uh, drugs in that class of tyrosine kinase inhibitors um, really work well for you know up to 90% really of our just patients. Um, we just have to uh, just not forget that we do have this subset of people that have been sub-characterized and as Jason mentioned, you know, Sheila fits in that category of these uh, very rare SDH deficient tumors. And, you know, although it's, it's great for our patients that are kit mutated, that are great candidates for Gleevec, we, we really need effective treatments for those other tumor subtypes like Sheila. And uh, her experience, you know, just listening to her uh, story from the video, um, I think of that frustration of feeling like someone with a rare tumor that's left behind. Um, it just highlights, I think, the importance of us being able to have the funding available to do these clinical trials for these rare uh, subsets of uh, patients, even within rare tumors. Great, I'm, I'm um, interested that you brought up TK inhibitors because that's um, actually a theme that we, we heard that came up in the last webinar on lung cancers. And then also back at our Czech celebration at the Salk Institute, um, we had Tony Hunter speak. And of course he had the yeah. novel breakthrough that led to the whole class of TK inhibitors. So that's interesting to see this woven through many cancer types. Um, Christian, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about metabolism and how that's a driver of all cancers and how that's relevant to the discussion of GIST and, and Sheila today. So in the same way so that we need energy to move around and think and, and all those tissues need that, a tumor which is trying to grow and the immune system from attacking it also has 
very large energetic needs. And what you can think about is when you have a, a particular tumor with a mutation in a metabolic enzyme like Shiba's does, that'll cause a molecular traffic jam through those energy pathways. And by identifying and understanding how those cells aren't are, are not working properly, the hope is that we can come up with more uh, distinct molecular ways to, to, to get at and kill those, those tumor cells. And, and that's what the approach really is that we've been taking with, uh, with, with Jason's laboratory. He's developed ways to culture these tumor cells that allow us to uh, use our approaches or bioengineering approaches to try to track how those molecules are, are moving differentially in, in the tumor type. And at the same time, this will ultimately feed into other treatment options that we can investigate to kind of add on to particular diets or, or other manipulations that may improve treatment further. Great. Um, so I don't know if it's if it's common for a medical oncologist and a, and a surgeon and a bioengineer to work together, um, but in this case you are working together. And Jason, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this collaboration came to be. Sounds like a lead into a joke. Yeah. <laughs> I, know. I don't have a punchline, but uh, so. Yeah. So um, it's not a common combination. Uh, you know, you'll see surgeons working with medical oncologists certainly, but. You know, this tripartite group of us is not a common. So, you know, it started out as um, several years ago, my laboratory, uh, you know, as we were started working on SDH deficient GIST, really spurred by uh, another patient who um, at the time was about 18 years old. And we were able to grow his cells at the time. And that had been the first time that anybody had been able to grow these SDH deficient gist in a petri dish so that we could start studying them in the laboratory, you know, being derived from a human, you know, cell. And people had done it in mice and you know, in other sorts, but it really wasn't the the actual like human tumors turned into cells that we could study. And so several years ago, we started doing that in the laboratory and we started. At the same time, we were obviously seeing the patients, and so we were sort of, again, bridging that lab and clinic all at the same time. And there's annually, we have a cancer center retreat here at UCSD, which is really the focus of it is, is to bring individuals together so that they can share what they're doing and perhaps meet other individuals or share what their work is so that they can build collaborations and you know, build upon that. Um, and so I was giving a talk at the time on just some of the preliminary evidence that we had. That we had been able to grow these cells and we had started doing some, some drug screening work over at Sanford Burnham Prebis, looking for drugs that could potentially work on this. And at this, at this cancer center retreat, Christian was in the audience. I had never met him. Um, you know, he asked some really astute questions about the metabolism of the cells. And, you know, we quickly realized in the midst of my talk that we had all this stuff in common. We sat down in the, at lunch, had lunch together. And quickly, within a couple of weeks, we had the cells over in his lab. He was doing some metabolism work. And lo and behold, you know, quickly started out, you know, transforming what was just this talk of some of the data that we had, but we were sort of kind of getting to the point where we couldn't go much farther with what we had with the resources that we had to then open it up to all these new potential collaborations with, with him and his group and really trying to understand the, the, the underlying biology of these tumors in order to identify drug targets. You know, in the meantime, as we were screening drugs and had patients that had failed all these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we had, we had stumbled upon temozolomide as a potential drug that would work. And um, Dr. Fanta had treated the first couple patients um, that we had prior to the trial um, when we had no other options. You know, we had these 18 year olds, 20 year olds where we were like, we have nothing else to treat these. And so we saw a couple of responses in those patients and that's what really 
opened our eyes to the potential that you know this might be a drug that we could use. And, and the great thing was it was already an FDA approved drug so we could get it, but it wasn't FDA approved for this indication. And so we still had to study it. We couldn't just keep giving it, but now we had you know, uh, some reasoning why behind the scenes that we, we could give it. And so that's where, you know, as Adam had been finishing his fellowship, Adam came on faculty. Adam and I had been working together for several years already now on just work. And so he came on faculty and took over as the lead of the grant of the um, clinical trial component of the grant. And so it really started bridging between, you know, my laboratory studying GIST, being able to grow the cells, getting the tissue from the, from the operating room when I can, when I operate on these patients to Adam seeing the patients, treating them with, with the drugs, to being able to then hand off cells to, to Christian in his laboratory to be able to study the metabolism of these cells and how, because of these STH mutations, the metabolism is altered and what other potential other targets might be available. And so that's really where, you know, all the parts of the puzzle started coming together to make this, this team come together that you would otherwise think maybe didn't fit so, together so well. Great, that's um, really helpful. And I think you've hit there on, on, two, on two themes, Jason. I mean, obviously it's the collaboration component of cross-functional um, interdisciplinary approaches to the same disease type. I think the second thing is that um, you all are doing things that have never been done before. And so Padre's Petal is, is, is funding those, um, like providing seed funding for this early um, kind of first in, of its own trial. So I wanna come back to that concept in a second. Um, but um, Adam, so you're the PI on this project that was funded back in 2018. Can you um, talk to us a little bit about how the trial is progressing and what you all have found? Um, sure, I'm happy to give a, you know, a little bit of update and also um, just, uh, I think it's really important to note here that as Jason was, uh, you know, kind of outlining the backstory, we had a lot of evidence from both the lab and from our own experience in the clinic at the Cancer Center using temozolomide in GIST patients. Um, of the FCH sub, uh, deficient subclass. And we were really kind of ready and raring to go with this project and we had this clinical trial in mind. So the pedal funding really allowed us to launch that project immediately as to, opposed to waiting for you know, long periods of you know, applying for outside funding mechanisms and potentially getting rejections. So we were able to really get the trial up and running uh, quickly in 2019 um, and we uh, have been uh, successful in enrolling six patients so far on the study. Um, keep in mind, this is an extremely rare disease, a few hundred uh, patients per year. Um, and we actually have patients coming from all over the country to um, see us here for evaluation for the trial. So, you know, Sheila's story of coming from San Francisco is um, uh, actually not unique. Most of our patients aren't San Diego based and are coming from afar. Um, and along those lines, um, the other, you know, great opportunity from this from this grant and you know getting the trial up and running here at UCSD um, is it has allowed us to you know successfully apply for other funding mechanisms um, to expand the reach of the trial and we'll now be expanding the trial to five additional sites throughout the country as a as a result of the you know, seed money that we got from Puddle to really launch this project um, to get more external sources of funding to you know grow the project further. Wow that's um Incredible. So five other sites. What's the status of, I mean, do you all partner with those other sites or how does, I don't know how that actually works out. So these are all other sites that have a strong interest in GIST and SDH deficient GIST. Um, and uh, we're sort of in the rollout process, I would say, of um, getting all of those sites up and running just from the, you know, various contracting and regulatory perspectives, but we hope to have them uh, open as soon as possible. That's very exciting. Um, and so um, what, I think, what do you think is needed to take this study forward? I know, Jason, one of the themes that you've talked about is personalized medicine, and that kind of came out of some of the early findings in GIST. Um, what is needed to take this forward and to make it more broadly applicable for other possible GIST patients or even other cancer types? That's, that's a great question. You know, we, one, so once we got the pedal, um, funding, we were we were able to apply for for grants as as Adam mentioned, and we eventually actually were able to get funded through the FDA 
to help continue to support the trial as we grow it to with, with the goal of enrolling 23 patients as a sort of a first step. But that funding also allows us to do a secondary uh, aim, which is to not only run the trial, but to start identifying other vulnerabilities in these cells at the, si at the basic science level, working with Christian and trying to identify are there other agents or other combinations of drugs that we can put together in, with temozolomide in order to sort of, you know, not just knock out one leg of the table, to, but to start maybe knocking out multiple legs of the table so that so the tumor falls down, if you will, or the table falls down. And so, you know, the next step is really trying to think about how we can take this to the next level of not just getting, you know, disease stability as Sheila described, but then trying to, you know, take patients and actually regress their tumors, you know, because it's, it's great to have disease control, but it's even better if we can have disease responses. And so, um, and so that's really the next thing that we're working on. There are other tumor types that have these SDH mutations. Um, within the, the sort of syndrome, if you will, of these hereditary tumors, um, patients also get another rare subtype of tumor called a paraganglioma, which is a, is a tumor that is of nerve cells within the, um, that spans basically from the neck all the way down through the pelvis. And these nerve cells can make hormones like adrenaline and derivatives of adrenaline as well. And so those tumors are driven via similar, you know, overlapping mechanisms. Um, kidney cancers can also have um, um, tumor or mutations in these same genes. So it starts opening up the potential of understanding how to treat other diseases based upon understanding just better and then as time is going on, we're starting to learn that there's a lot of other disease types like liver, like bile duct tumors that occur within the liver that have mutations in other members of the um, metabolism pathways that, have, that are driving those diseases. And so kind of going back to as we understand more about metabolism and how mutations are driving the biology of these tumors, we can better understand what are some of the mechanisms that are you know, underlying vulnerabilities or other driver mechanisms that we don't necessarily understand right now how to target these tumor types, you know, whether it be GIST or others. Okay, um, we had a, a very specific question come in that I, that I wanted to share right now, which is what is known about the mu mutation load and T cells that recognize these tumors? And do you know if these tumors express MHC at lower than normal levels? You want to take a step at that first, Adam? Or you... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can just say, generally speaking, uh, unlike the advances that we've had in immunotherapy and many types of solid tumors, sarcomas, generally speaking, and also just generally speaking, just unfortunately haven't fallen into that group of tumors that um, respond well to immunotherapy. So um, there is a little bit of a, a literature, and there are, have been some trials in, in kind of all comers of GIST with immunotherapy. We haven't seen um, the sort of uh, home run results, however, in GIST that we've seen in a lot of other tumor types like melanoma or lung, for example. And we've seen, you know, there's, there was a trial up at UCLA, um, it was a small trial of, of as, as Adam mentioned, and, you know, there was no responders in that trial. Um, again, it was all comers. Um, we know that the, the immune, you know, the immune system is not very sort of ramped up in, inside the tumors themselves in the, in the GIS, uh, in the, especially in these STH GIS from our experience. Um, there are a few subsets where there might be a few more, you know, immune cell infiltrates, but, but the immune system has not been a great target for this tumor type as of yet. Um, despite the fact that there is some emerging data about the role of the immune system in these tumor cells. Great. Um, thank you. Um, I, this is, I, I understand that the, the trial that we've funded is focused on a, a, a subtype of GIST, um, and this is just one trial, and I assume that there are probably several others that you all are 
um, running um, with other just patients. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this fits into like a, a wider portfolio that you all are studying of just cancers. So we have other clinical trials open for, um, again, the more uh, more common subtypes of GIST, the uh, kit mutated GIST um, population. Uh, and I think it's important to note though that uh, there's not a ton of GIST studies out there. You know, it's, it's not, it's a rare tumor. It's not like uh, more common types where there's just many, many clinical trials, you know, nationally. And specifically within this SDH deficient uh, subset, um, Again, there have been some clinical studies, mostly at the NIH, but um, there aren't a lot of clinical trial opportunities for um, that subclass of patients. So having this available for, um, you know, the SDH sub deficient subset of just patients has been important. Um, and, uh, you know, I can, we always have as many clinical trials open as we can within every disease area, including just. Um, so those, you know, change over time as trials come and go. Uh, but it's much more likely that trials are going to be coming and going um, again sort of at the national level you know sponsored studies that we're participating in um, for that more common uh, kit mutated population okay um in a second i want to uh, turn it over to brady and see if any see if he has any questions and tie it back to where we opened with sheila's journey but i just wanted i asked that question because i wanted to reiterate to pedal fundraisers and participants who are on the line of just that this is a very rare cancer, um, and it's a very personal jo journey for whoever is, is is facing it. And this is just one of the 71 projects that we've funded across all different cancer types. And so our dollars are really focused on some of the most common deadly cancers, like lung cancers that we see very, very um, frequently, along with just um, in a fantastic team here with us today that's um, doing some really novel um, leading research. So um, Brady, um, I wondered if you, um, in Sheila's video, she mentioned that she had a surgery um, with Dr. Cyclic who uh, removed 42 tumors, I think. Could you tell us a little bit about what, um, how Sheila is doing now and, and what it's like? And then also, um, if you have any questions uh, for the panelists, I offer that to you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it was a heck of a surgery. Um, it was it was 42 tumors. It was Sheila's stomach being removed, her appendix being removed, her spleen and gallbladder being removed, portions of her liver being removed, and a small portion of her pancreas being removed. Um, and J Jason basically performed a 12 to 13 hour surgery uh, on her. And I, you know, I saw him at the end of it. He came and talked to my family and he was exhausted. Um, and um, I can't, I can't even uh, put into words the gratitude that I have. Um, and the gratitude that I have for all of you, you know, Adam and Christian, this is actually my first time meeting you and I'm so grateful and appreciative to you. And, um, you know, all the, like the 25 participants that I just see in this bar down here, like when I talk about an angel team, like y'all are part of it too. Um, you're all putting it together. Um, now Sheila's, she's doing great. You know, it's an ongoing journey. Like, um, she's, she's a beast. She, 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 as quickly as possible was back in her CrossFit classes until, you know, the pandemic didn't allow it. Now we have a Peloton in our shed and she's rocking out on that. Um, she, you know, she, her physical recovery has been really amazing. Um, Negotiating life without a stomach is is an ongoing process of figuring out how to um, get really the nourishment that she needs um, and still stay comfortable. Um, and so that's that's an ongoing thing that I think we're getting better and better at, um, but that's still something to be figured out. Um, you know, we're still getting scans and our most recent scan, um, there is a new growth that we're not quite sure exactly what it is, but that we're negotiating. You know, we had six months of a fantasy of maybe we're cancer free forever, even though that was highly unlikely. Um, and now we're back in the reality of how much we need this team. Um, but, you know, Sheila is just starting her first year in grad school, getting her PhD in psychology. And that even that act in itself is such an act of faith in the abilities of this team that's on the call right now, that, that, that it's worth putting that time into, that it's worth putting that energy into, and that there's a long life ahead of being able to help other people with what she's learning. Um, you know, I don't, I don't specifically have any questions for this team, but I do really want to take the opportunity to 
to share in my own words what I feel like we, I've heard a lot in this call, which is that, um, you know, this is a really rare disease and there aren't a lot of people working on it and there aren't a lot of opportunities for um, development in it. And so it's, <laughs> excuse me, um, so we need your help. Um, so we, we need, we need um, folks like you to be supporting um, Christian and Adam and Jason and everyone who's working on this because, um, you know, my, my brother's in fundraising and he talks a lot about like how he has to tell everyone about the impact that's happening. And I think, you know, there's two different ways to think about impact. There's like the quantity and then there's the quality. And, you know, a lot of people go for quantity, like how, how much is this spreading? How many different people are being affected? And I also think it's just really important to think about the quantity, you know, uh, the quality. Um, there are those few of us, myself and Sheila included, who um, have no hope without teams like this, without contributions from y'all. Like we, we just, the life we want isn't there unless we get helped. And so um, I just want to say thank you for, for contributing to, you know, um, Padre's Pedal and contributing to this team because we, we desperately need it. And the impact that it has on our lives is, um, unexplainable so um yeah thank thank you everyone and that, that, that's all i have to say well um i think for you that's a little hard to follow but um i think it makes it easy to talk about quality when you're funding researchers and surgeons and oncologists like the ones we have on the line today and so it's um it's not a job it's an opportunity of all of us and just so rewarding to hear personal stories of how this is really making a difference so um, I have another question that, that has come up, which is really interesting. And so this is, um, Jason, you mentioned that um, Sheila's type of GIST is hereditary. And the question is, is there a low cost genetic testing surveillance available for first degree relatives affected by this cancer? And could Sheila's FDH gene mutation have been identified via genetic testing? So great question. Um, so, you know, a majority of GISTs are not hereditary, just so that um, it's only this, you know, small subsets of them, these SDH deficient ones. You know, Sheila's is a little bit funny in that it's behaving and it's got the same kind of genetic background as the hereditary ones, but she's one of the very unique people out there, which probably only represents maybe 10 to 15 cases a year that don't have a hereditary mutation in this. So she's even like a rare of a rare. Um, you know, as I said, she's literally probably 10 to 15 cases per year is like exactly like what she has. Now, for the other, you know, 200 or so, 250 cases a year in the US of these SDH deficient GIST, those families um, where an individual is identified to have an SDH deficient GIST, those families, um, absolutely need to have genetic screening, or at least we would strongly recommend it. There are certainly families that don't want to know because they're, you know, obviously, af you know, afraid of what the future potentially can hold. It's not a disease where everybody will get the disease, meaning that patients may, or, you know, patients and family members may carry the genetic mutation, but may never get the disease. It may skip one generation, two generations, and then somebody somebody gets it. And we certainly have plenty of younger people where that is the case. But when we do identify somebody, we do recommend, we do refer them for medical genetic testing to evaluate whether this is, you know, something that, you know, which parent has, which, which siblings have, you know, et cetera, because those that do have the genetic mutation should get annual screening um, for GIST as well as these paragangliomas, which are these other tumors that go sort of hand in hand with these SDH deficient GISTs. And so it, it certainly becomes a, a part where it's not just, you know, one person in the family, it sometimes is multiple people in the family, you know, which again is kind of goes back to that, those three bad things I was saying, it, young people, you know, we don't have good drugs and it's families affected. It's not just, oh, you had bad luck. You're the one person that got it, you know, or you smoked too much or you drank or whatever. That was your predisposing factor. This is just 
the, the luck of the draw of, you know, who our parents were and how we were born and what genes were passed on, fortunately. Thank you. I think that that question is um, is great, and I think it highlights on the one hand how cancer can be so overwhelming, and on the other hand, how there's so much opportunity. And in this conversation alone, we've talked about developing new drugs, and we've also talked about um, diagnostics to earlier and better identify um, cancers. And there's just so many, you know, tying it back to Brady of creating hope. And I think that that's where um, why Padres Pedal is so excited to do what we do and to continue fundraising and to continue funding diverse teams like like the one with us today. And so um, I just a couple other takeaways. If anyone else has any questions, um, now would be a great time to submit those. I don't see any right now. Um, but we've talked about collaboration. We've talked about seed funding. Um, we've talked about hope and how this is translating from the bench side to the bedside and to individual lives like Brady and Sheila. And I think there's two other things that come forward and uh, that we haven't touched on. And one of those is just the concept of a multiplier and that um, Padres Petal provided seed funding for one trial and Sheila was patient zero. And now the trial in only a year, year and a half is rolling forward at five different sites across the country. And that's just really exciting for us to see that um, the dollars that Padres Petal participants are raising is going on to create this snowball and this multiplier. And that gets us really excited. Um, and the, the second thing is just how special San Diego is. Um, and that Brady and, and Sheila were um, given this bad news in San Francisco, and they didn't let that stop them. They came to, to San Diego and to Moore's Cancer Center. And um, although today we don't have some of the other beneficiary institutions on the panel, um, they're here asking questions, um, and they were on some of our last panels. So San Diego is just a, a phenomenal place to, to do research and to collaborate, and, and we're excited to have you all with us and to be part of it. So. Um, with that, I think today has been just such a phenomenal experience to learn more about the, the trial that we funded and to learn about Brady and Sheila. Um, I have to give thanks um, to you, Brady and Sheila. I, we'll, we'll, of course, send her the recording of this, but for having the courage to share your story. Um, we can't wait to meet you in person. Um, and thanks also to the team, Jason, Adam, and Christian for everything that you do and for being such tremendous stewards. Um, we'd love to continue funding your research and uh, we're not stopping now. And, um, and thanks to the fundraisers and participants and donors um, on the line for making this all possible. Hopefully it's clear that every dollar we raise is having a great impact. And then um, just lastly, uh, to thank our sponsors, some of whom are listed here that are doing some pretty amazing things um, in San Diego life science industry and COVID-19 and, and cancer and, and other things. So without our sponsors, our organization isn't able to donate 100% of fundraising dollars directly to the mission. So um, with that, again, many, many thanks across the, the board. We will um, share this recording. We'll share it with the, the team here. Um, and on YouTube, and look forward to seeing you all hopefully soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.